<laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for coming. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Megan and my business is called Chiron Equine. I recently leased a farm down in Ancaster, Ontario, where I am going to be doing quite a bit of layup and rehab, which is why this topic is so, so important to me. And I will let Stephanie introduce herself. I'm Stephanie Crawford. Um, I know Megan mostly just through the local horse community, and uh, we've had the opportunity to work together a little bit in the past. Um, I'm an equine chiropractor and human chiropractor, um, and uh, I have a sort of a special interest in um, the like biomechanical aspect of working with horses. Uh, I used to be a riding coach and uh, I did uh, I have a bit of a background in riding biomechanics as well. Um, my practice is currently um, mostly horses and seeing riders actually on the road uh, in barns uh, and working with horses and riders uh, together as a team. Uh, my business is called On Course Chiropractic. If you want to hook up with me on social media, um, that's the uh, keyword to search either in Facebook or Instagram. Fantastic. All right. I'm going to make sure I have our notes pulled up here. The update version. <laughs> and then we will get started. And um, like Stephanie just said a couple of minutes ago, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I will keep that monitored so that we can get those questions in in the section we're already talking about instead of waiting till the end. Yeah. And then uh, if you don't think of a question until later, that's totally fine too. We'll leave a little bit of time at the end uh, if anyone does have any questions, but um, yeah, definitely. We can also just answer anything that comes up as we go along. I was really excited that you um, uh, asked me to chat with you about this topic tonight. And when I was doing the research, I uh, started to get really excited about it. Um, like this is really applicable, I think, to a lot of people uh, who are currently like having horses, horses under my care. And I think it will help, um, uh, horse owners that like, hopefully won't have, um, horses come up with serious injuries, but if they do, um, to help them understand a little bit about the healing process and things that they might be able to do to support the horses and also things they may be able to do to support the horses to prevent injury as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of dive in a little bit. Yeah. So when we're talking about layup or rehab, just in general, we're talking about horses that are either on stall rest or small paddock rest, horses that are maybe waiting for a surgery or have just come off a surgery. Or um, one of the other areas of my business is in breeding. So mares while they're pregnant or post-pregnancy and um, how we can keep them as fit as possible through that process as well. So those are the sort of things that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so to start off with, what are the effects that stall rest can have on a horse? Um, well, the positive effects and the reason that we have stall rest is, um, you know, our, our goal with it is to immobilize, um, injured tissues so that they have an opportunity to heal. Um, so, uh, if, uh, we have a tendon tear, uh, for example, would be a really classic example of why we would put a horse on stall rest. Um, the idea is we don't, when that tendon is newly injured um, and we, we don't want the horse loading it more than um, necessary and increasing the chances that it could make that injury bigger um, or just stop it from healing by loading that injured structure. So we're trying to keep them in a smaller space basically to stop them from doing extra impact um, on those injured tissues. Um, unfortunately, that can lead to some negative side effects um, because generally speaking in broad terms our bodies don't particularly like to be immobilized um, so uh, some of the things that can happen when the horse is on layup and like part of the reason why we want to pass this out a little bit today um, is because we can have these unwanted effects on tissue so for example um, we know uh, this has been sort of extensively studied in human and animal studies. Um, it, uh, we know that bone can decrease in density when we're immobilized. So horses that aren't moving around as much, um, you're actually going to have changes to bone density and the mineral content of the bone. 
Um, so that could um, decrease bone strength. Um, and it also um, can decrease bone tur cell turnover. So that could affect your horse, if, especially if they're dealing with a bony injury. We want to immobilize anything that's unstable until it's strong enough to be loaded, um, but we certainly don't want to spend extra time immobilized. Um, the same thing, a similar process happens in other structures in the body. So in joints, we have articular cartilage that um, is making up the joint itself. That's the surface that is a bit of a shock absorber and provides lubrication for the joint. Uh, when we immobilize a joint, that cartilage starts to degenerate uh, and actually resorb. So you have less um, useful cartilage in the joint. Uh, and the other thing that happens is you have increased collagen crosslinks. And this is basically, um, it can happen in many tissues in the body, many connective tissues. Uh, but what happens if, is you can have organized fibers that run along each other and make a nice uh, organized tissue, or you can start to have these cross links that develop in between the organized fibers and they make it a bit of a disorganized mess and they inhibit motion in those tissues. Um, so this is seen on microscopes, but it, it happens in uh, cartilage in the joints uh, and that can lead to stiffness. So um, and tiny, tiny scars. That, yeah, yeah, so that's a good way to think about it. It's kind of the same process that happens in any kind of scar tissue um, is you have these increased disorganized fibers being laid down. Um, so, and it can happen in uh, the joint capsule um, and the synovial membrane of the joints themselves. Wow. Um, so this is gonna lead to joint stiffness and joint contracture. And then in muscle, we have um, muscle atrophy uh, when muscles are immobilized. You're going to have smaller muscles. Um, you're also going to have decreased motor control. So, um, and this is partly because there's a lower calcium uptake, and we need calcium in our muscles in our muscles to have the action potential that gets the muscle fiber to contract. Um, so there is a change not only just because we're not using the muscles and they get weaker, but there's actually um, some changes in the way that muscles uptake calcium. Um, this decreases our motor control and it can also decrease how strong the muscle is. So the force of, of contraction. Um, so um, we're going to get atrophy in uh, the muscle and it's going to be worse in non weight bearing limbs. So, um, so we know that if the horse is really not weight bearing, we're going to start to see really visible results of that atrophy. Um, so we obviously want to get them weight bearing again as, as soon as possible. Um, in ligaments, it's a similar effect. Um, so you're going to have decreased strength. It's going to be easy, easier to pull, um, to break that ligament if too much force is applied. Um, there's going to be decreased energy stored. So that means decreased elasticity in the ligaments. Um, so again, that can predispose to further injury. Um, there's going to be more cross-linked fibers like we talked about in uh, the other connective tissues. Um, and more random fire, fiber orientation. And we really don't want that in ligaments. Ligaments are very dense, organized, um, strong structures that, um, that control our joints. They are what goes sort of between two bones to make, um, to keep those bones together, essentially. <laughs> um, and uh, we know too that ligament insertion sites take longer than ligaments to, to regain their strength. So when we lose that strength in a ligament, that insertion site, which is often the point where you have ligament failure in a traumatic injury, um, is the last thing to get strong again. Um, in addition to those body changes, um, horses also undergo stress when they're in the stall. So that could lead to other secondary issues um, like ulcers in horses. Um, and it can also lead to increased risk of injury when horses uh, are turned out again. Um, I thought it was interesting. There was actually a study that was done on this. Um, and uh, any horse owner knows that if you keep a horse in, um, you're going to have a holy terror when you turn them back out again. Um, but they actually did a study and it was on um, uh, or it was inspired by PMU mares um, that are kept in stalls and they wanted to study the effect of keeping horses in. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and show you some of the results of that study because I thought it was really interesting that they actually studied this. Just going to see if I can. There we go. Where is it?
Um, yeah, so they took these pregnant mares and they had two groups. So the first group um, were exercised daily. So they were turned out for half an hour a day. And the other group was turned out for half an hour once a week. <laughs> and uh, they actually had like much different behaviors between the mares that were turned out daily and the mares that were turned out once a week in that um, the uh, once a week turnout group uh, showed a lot more um, trotting, cantering and galloping around. Um, and the ones that were turned out daily showed more walking um, and more standing and more grazing. So um, there was a difference in behavior of those turned out horses uh, just on their behavior when they're turned out. So I just thought that was really interesting. And it's something to kind of keep in the back of our minds when we're thinking about turning horses out after um, after their, uh, their stall rest time um, and things, you know, just trying to strategize, can we, how can we keep them moving so that we can minimize this effect? Yeah, I mean, I certainly see it in my, I've got two thoroughbred mares that hate being in even just overnight. And I had to keep both of them in the other night because my blankets were soaked through and turned them oh. out in the morning. And the two of them ripped around for 20 minutes, leaping and bucking and rearing at each other. Like you were in for eight hours, girls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they really, um, they like the routine and they like their exercise. Yeah. Um, so the big takeaway, I guess, um, to answer the big question of like the effects of stall rest is that all of the tissues of the body are affected when the body's immobilized. Um, so we want to minimize the time spent immobilized in the stall. And we also want to find safe ways to keep them moving, um, even when they have to be on stall rest. Okay. So what can we do to mitigate some of those things? Um, so... That is uh, kind of, you know, the crux of this is, is balancing because we know um, we, we have them in a stall for a reason um, and, you know, it's important to give tissues the time to heal. Uh, but at the same time, we do want to try and introduce movement early and often. Um, and uh, uh, there's a, a bunch of different reasons why. Um, it's not just because we want to prevent them from running around the pasture and re-injuring themselves. There's a lot of um, uh, things to consider when it comes to the quality of healing of the injury itself. Um, we know that some of the effects of traumatic injury on a tissue include altered sensory perception, um, so this is commonly known as like proprioception. Um, that's like the way uh, a body part talks to the brain and sort of explains where it is in space. So if you close your eyes and, and wiggle your fingers, that feeling of your joints moving, that's your proprioception. Um, uh, how good your body is at telling your brain where your limbs are in space, that type of thing. Um, you also can have like altered uh, nociception, so uh, more pain fibers as well after a traumatic injury. Um, and all of these things can lead to decreased motor control. Um, and the reason that is not good is because it can actually predispose you to re-injury. Uh, and a really good example of this is if you've ever sprained your ankle um, and you're walking along and three weeks later, boom, you sprain it again, same ankle. And a lot of people have chronic ankle sprains. And, and the reason is once we sprain those ligaments, we don't, our body doesn't always redevelop that good proprioception to that ankle. And we just walk around with this altered proprioception. Our body is just not as good as organizing that foot um, to land in the right way. And then we are predisposed to spraining it again. Um, so, and in human studies, uh, we've seen that delayed uh, physical therapy after a traumatic injury can actually uh, predispose to uh, stiffness as well. So not only the proprioceptive side of things, but also um, just increased fibrosis and increased stiffness. Um, so in, so that, those are the two main reasons that we want to have, other than avoiding explosions in the field, we want to um, have the horse able to have good body control and we also want to reduce um, the buildup of scar tissue, fibrosis, and um, things of that nature. Um, yeah, so I guess that's, um, that's that in a nutshell. Awesome. So when we talk about wanting to mitigate risk, what are some of the safe exercises that we can do to keep them mobile? Right. Um, so I, I want to just 
uh, start answering that by saying that it, it really depends on the individual. So I'm going to give some ideas of things that would be common, either that I would recommend to my patients who are recovering um, from an injury and on layup or um, you know, that are just common practices, but uh, really this is kind of comes down to the individual as well. So if you are, currently have a horse with an injury, um, you don't want to just try all these things willy nilly. You really want to work with your vet, um, your rehab specialist, your chiro, massage therapist, physio, um, people that um, sort of work in the, the field to constantly evaluate your horse, figure out where they're at and figure out what is going to be safe for them. Um, so one of the first things we can do that is usually considered a pretty safe thing to do for stall rested horses is um, like hand walking or tack walking. So sometimes if the injury, if they're able, um, it's actually better to be on them than hand walking them. Um, part of that is just because um, we can control the activity a little bit more. Um, some cases that just the way that the nature of the injury, it might be better to hand walk the horse at the beginning. It also may depend a little bit on your horse's level of training, <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, but controlled activity is what we're after. Um, so like usually that means um, going slow um, and doing straight lines. Although depending on the injury there, it's definitely a place for doing bending lines and other type of work. Um, but yeah, typically speaking, um, we want to get that horse out and moving. And ideally, um, you know, twice a day, that's always not, not always possible, just depending on the stable, but the more they're out and moving around, uh, the better. Um, and that, then, sorry, that one of the reasons that I really got passionate about layup farms specifically, I was working at a, at a racing layup farm and I've also been in large, just boarding situations. And if the day goes sideways, the handwalk horses were the first thing to go right? Let a, like forget twice a day. You might be three days in between hand walks because something hit the fan. And I really felt like there's space in the riding horse world where it's so common in the racing world to have a dedicated space where like, that's just what we're doing. We're just here to rehab, um, to get those hand walks in, yeah. to fly the kite for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, yeah, and, hopefully there's not too much kite flying, but uh, this time of year, there seems to be quite a lot, even yeah. horses that are not on stall rest. So, um, but yeah, this, you're right. The situation on the ground is not always ideal. Um, and, you know, sometimes like reality sets in, but um, hopefully like the more people that are kind of thinking about these, you know, reasons why it's important, um, maybe it'll help to sort of advocate for their own horse or to make sure they get out to the barn or to consider, you um, you know, a rehab or, or layup facility if um, if their situation doesn't offer um, what their horse needs, right? Um, yeah, so, and, uh, you know, sometimes too, um, you know, riding is going to precede uh, turnout as well. And again, that is because we want to have that horse conditioned in a controlled environment as much as possible before sending them out into the field where they're going to be running and kicking and playing with their buddies um, and slipping in the mud, that kind of thing. Um, all of those activities, our horses need to be conditioned for um, in order to prevent uh, new injuries from happening or re-aggravating old injuries. So if we can get those limbs used to some dynamic activity in a controlled environment, like doing trot and canter sets in a controlled environment before we turn them back out, um, oftentimes that can be quite ideal. Um, yeah. Uh, especially if the horse is already like reasonably well trained, um, you know, we can use that to our advantage because that horse is going to, um, you know, be able to be ridden in a way that's balanced and, and perhaps in a better posture than they would be if they were just turned out. So in some situations that might actually be a better um, than, uh, you know, the, the typical, um, like stall rest and small paddock turnout than, you know, regular turnout, then return to ridden work. Um, so it's just something, some sort of food for thought on that aspect. Yeah. That's um, really interesting. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast with a rehab vet, um, whose name is slipping my mind at the moment and she was advocating for that. And I thought, 
I'd like to um, credit her. And I, uh, it was, do you know the podcast? It was um, The Humble Hoof. Uh, I don't know if you guys listen to that. It's a great podcast. Um, the host interviews um, professionals from all across the equine world. Um, so it's basically like focused on hoof health, but um, she kind of branches out into other areas as well. But it's, all the guests are really, really excellent. Awesome. Um, so yeah, just a little plug for them. Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of um, exercise, so tack and hand walking is definitely one thing that we can do in that controlled exercise. Um, the next category of, of things that we could do would be um, our manual therapy. So uh, this is another way to get joints um, and soft tissues moving. Uh, so if someone uh, like myself as a chiropractor or um, a physiotherapist or some other rehab specialist comes into the barn, we can perform some joint range of motion. Uh, so we want to make sure those immobilized joints aren't stiffening up uh, like we know can happen in immobilized joints. So we're going to go in and perform some perhaps some passive range of motion on the joints, um, joint mobilization or manipulation if you're a chiropractor um, and uh, this is just with the goal of um, increasing lubrication, decreasing stiffness. Uh, the same thing goes for soft tissue release. So the, um, everything kind of works in concert. We want to mobilize the joints. We want to work into the myofascia as well. So um, massage, uh, myofascial release, um, other fascial work, um, such as like instrument assisted techniques, that type of thing can all help to decrease that fibrosis, decrease that cross fiber linkages being laid down, those type of things. Um, and they can also do well to uh, relieve pain as well, uh, which is another thing um, that, you know, is bound to go hand in hand with not only the injury itself, but also the compensations for the injury. Um, and also just the fact that the horse is immobilized. Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah. I feel like we probably don't even consider that most of the time. It wasn't something I gave a lot of consideration to. And then I've actually broken my shoulder a couple of weeks ago. Oh no. Pain I'm having in my mid back and my neck is way worse than the actual fracture. Yeah. And that doesn't take very long as I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sorry to hear about your shoulder. <laughs> um, it, I hope that you're getting some physiotherapy. I will. The, the doctor has asked me not to start anything for another four weeks. Mm. just because of where but after it, this talk you might you I, might reconsider um <laughs> some things that you could do to start mobilizing those tissues even earlier um <laughs> with the approval of your your doctor and yeah. uh, trained professionals of course um so uh yeah but and and especially like this sort of leads into one of the next things i was going to say is that often we're um uh, the manual therapy is going to target sort of like areas that are secondary to the main injury. So we might not be working on the tendon itself, but we might be working up that myofascial chain um, to decrease tension that's happening um, and find areas of compensation and work on those. Like, so for your example, when you hurt your shoulder, um, you have to use all the muscles that attach into your neck to move your arm around because that shoulder joint isn't working properly. And you get these compensation effects that you're feeling right now. Um, and that can actually really affect how you move. It can affect your mood. It can affect how much pain you're in. So all those kind of things happen to horses as well. Um, so that's another great reason to get some manual therapy in there early. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, and then the other aspect of manual therapy is actually more like targeting the, the site of injury. So we want to improve healing to the area um, and we can do passive range of motion and, and some sliding techniques uh, around injured areas. We can also have techniques that actually improve vascular proliferation. So uh, like blood cells, uh, new blood vessels going into the healed area to bring blood supply. Um, Graston technique is one of the uh, instrument assisted techniques that um, have actually been shown to improve vascular proliferation. I'm making a plug to it because I'm a Graston practitioner, but, and I've, but also because I've read some of the research on it and it's really interesting how we can use some of this me mechanotherapy um, to assist with tendon and ligament healing in some of the superficial structures 
Um, this has been studied quite a lot in humans. Uh, in the horse world, it's a relatively new idea. Um, and so it might not be something that's on a veterinarian's radar um, because it's not very well known yet. But in the human physiotherapy world, it's quite well established. And there's actually been a fair amount of research on um, the, those type of, of techniques. Um, other things that would be more familiar to the veterinary world would be things like shockwave. Um, and the goals would be similar to have a mechanic effect on the region to bring blood supply and improve healing. Um, so there are, are things like that that we can be doing um, to help the healing uh, site itself. Um, and then the other uh, modality that's worth mentioning um, is laser therapy. Um, it also has the effect of improving healing um, by actually increasing cell metabolism. Um, and it can be used with um, pretty much all the other modalities that I mentioned. Um, it's very, um, very safe and, uh, and non-invasive. Uh, you don't have to sedate horses to use laser on them or anything like that. So it can be a really nice option as well. Um, and again, like a lot of emerging uh, research in the human world and then some starting to emerge in the equine world too, but, um, but not as much, but uh, just so that, you know, that's out there as well. Um, and then, oh, I see um, Catherine was asking about Beamer therapy. I think I had that written down in here somewhere just as um, uh, a way to address uh, sort of symptom relief and that type of thing. Um, Beamer and like PEMF and stuff like that. Um, again, like it's a very new thing. There's not a whole lot of uh, independent research that's been done. Um, but my personal sense is that it's a very safe and non-invasive thing um, that you can do that horses seem to respond positively to. Um, so those type of therapies that can, um, the same with like light touch therapies, equibo, um, acupuncture, even all those type of things can help to um, relax tight muscles, um, provide general pain relief, all those type of things. So I think they have their place for sure. Um, and the other one worth mentioning would be uh, kinesio tape. And kinesio tape has the ability to support structures. Um, and one of its main benefits um, is uh, actually for proprioception. So again, when you put tape on an area, you can, um, it pulls on the tissues around the area. So that can actually help give feedback to the brain about what's going on in that area. Because every time you move your joint, you're going to get a little pull on the skin and fascia that are just full of um, proprioceptors and they're going to send information back to your brain. So in terms of maintaining proprioception to an area, that can be another great tool as well. And tapers, I'm sure, would have other ideas about how tape can help support certain injuries as well. Um, so that's kind of the manual therapy aspect of what um, we can do to mitigate some of those effects of, of stall rest and support healing. Um, the other um, thing that you might end up doing yourself is doing some exercises with your horse um, above and beyond your, your hand walking uh, type exercises. Um, so I'm thinking a little bit about uh, stretches would be the first thing to come into mind. Uh, and again, this might not be appropriate in all stages of injury. It depends a little bit on what the injury is um, and what stage of healing your horse is at. So it's something you would want to check in with your um, chiro or other body worker or your vet to see um, what they think about uh, uh, when you should be adding that in. Um, I will say that generally speaking, um, if we're talking about passive stretches, they should be done after the horse has worked when the muscles are nice and warm. That's when you're gonna get the best effect from them. Um, but again, um, it's something that you would wanna check in to see when it's appropriate. Um, something else that you could do uh, is um, uh, using stability pads. So I'm just gonna share my screen again. One sec. When I was practicing doing this earlier, I was like, um, I'm just like waiting for this black thing to go away so I can share my PowerPoint properly. It doesn't matter too much. Um, so uh, these are stability pads. And just in case anyone hasn't seen them before, um, the ones on the left are actually made for horses. They're called, can you see my screen, Megan? Yeah, I can see yeah, it. Okay. Um, 
I just can't like put it in slideshow oh. mode because there's like the zoom bar is covering that button right now. But um, as long as you guys can see the pictures, it doesn't matter. You should be able to just grab the black bar and drag it anywhere you want. Oh, hang on. Oh, hey, hey. We all learned something today. <laughs> Um, so those are stability pads. So the ones on the left are surefoot pads and uh, they're made for horses in particular. They come in a lot of different um, stiffnesses as well as you can see the yellow ones in the back are on an angle. Um, so they have some, there are like surefoot practitioners out there that are trained in how to use these and then they can, you know, people can definitely use them on their own as well once they know um, what's an appropriate way to use them for their horse. Um, the ones on the right are actually human rehab stability pads. They're the same idea, but like everything, um, the human version is a lot cheaper. <laughs> um, but uh, these blue ones I actually have in my practice and they hold up pretty well. Um, the idea behind these type of things, again, is more like proprioception in nature. So we're trying to um, train the horse's balance a little bit. Um, so some of the typical things I might do with a stability pad for a horse that is immobilized due to an injury on stall rest, the first thing I would do is just have them stand on pads like in the pictures. Um, and uh, if you've ever had rehab for like a lower limb issue yourself, you might've had the chance to use these. But when you stand on them, they just give, they make you just a little bit wobbly because it's not quite a stable surface. Um, so you have to work a little bit to balance yourself. Um, and we can, once the horse gets used to balancing on them, then we can make it more difficult for them by perturbing them, like maybe doing some tail pulls, pushing them side to side, um, having them do carrot stretches, uh, that type of thing on the pads, uh, different things where they have to change their balance and, um, uh, and try to stay on the pads ideally. <laughs> um, and then uh, we can also do the, um, you know, lift one leg and have them balance on, on the other foot on the pad, those type of things. So again, like those would uh, be a great exercise that are, it's pretty low impact. So you could definitely integrate something like that into your program early on and perhaps uh, get some of those proprioceptive benefits going even before you're back into doing other work with the horse. Um, and then here. I'm just going to leave that up like that um, and just check in back with my notes. Yeah. So the next thing I wanted to mention was um, uh, doing some like core strength exercises. So those are things that you can do right in the barn. Um, and I talked about one already, which is like a baited carrot stretch. Um, other things include belly lifts and pelvic tilts um, and maybe even some other more gymnastic exercises, um, like doing some backing up. Um, uh, and then depending on where your horse is at, you could, uh, add in, um, like doing small bending circles, um, and walk poles. So some, there's some walking exercises that you could do fairly early on in your horse's rehab. Um, and some things you could just do even in the barn itself. Um, and again, you'd want to just check in with your vet and your rehab specialist to see when is the right time to add those things in. Um, but just to give you an idea what's out there. Um, there's, this is an example of some of, um, oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> um, some of the study that's been done on core training. So the study was done, um, this is something I want to talk about right now. Yeah. Um, so this study was done and uh, it followed on an earlier study that just looked at uh, doing uh, actually baited carrot stretches alone. And then they did this study that showed um, the effects of doing, uh, this is the wrong study, sorry. There we go. Um, <laughs> that uh, uh, they did a combination of the uh, baited carrot stretches. So where they were having the horses stretch around to the side, having them stretch with chin between the legs, um, having them stretch on different angles. Um, and then they also did some gymnastic exercises. So in this study, it was the things I just mentioned. So they did, um, I think backing small circles and walk poles. 
as well as, oh, Marcia, your uh, microphone is um, not on mute. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and then they measured um, basically the core stability of those horses. So um, they were, they actually did like movement uh, monitoring and they um, put some sensors on the horse's back and they basically measured um, the core dynamic stability of those horses moving. And um, dynamic stability basically, ref in this case, it's referring to how good the horse's muscles are at controlling the horse's motion. So we want a certain amount of stability in the muscles. One of the main muscles um, that controls the horse's like thoracolumbar spine is called multifidus. And it's a muscle that sort of runs intersegmentally. So in between each of the vertebrae, um, and it's, uh, it's really important for stabilizing the spine. So they also ultrasounded the multifidus muscle and uh, just checked how big the muscle was after doing these exercises. Um, so they found that um, doing these type of exercises could increase the size, of, the size of multifidus. And it also increased the thoracolumbar mobility like that, sorry, the dynamic stability of the spine uh, when the horse is moving. So, and all they're doing is just those simple exercises. Um, and the other thing was in the study that was really interesting is they did the exercises three days a week and they had another group where they did them five days a week. And they actually found that there was not a lot of difference between those two groups. So um, it was a lot better than doing nothing, but um, in between the two groups, um, you didn't really need to do it more than three times a week to see a difference. Um, so that can be kind of nice. Sometimes people feel like I think they get demotivated if they um, fall behind a little bit on doing these type of things. But, um, you know, you don't need to get out every single day in order to have a benefit from, from some of these things. Um, and most horses that are on stall rest for lower limb injuries could easily do um, these uh, type of exercises without having any harm to their horse's rehab um, and uh, healing of the injury at hand. Um, the other positive of doing these types of exercises is that it's mental stimulation for your horse because they're on layup, they're not in regular work, they might not have the same socialization with other horses. Um, so it can be a good way just to provide them some, some stimulation and alleviate some boredom on their part. And if people wanted to know a little bit more about those stretches and things, where would you send them? Um, there's definitely, there's probably a lot of, um, online, uh, information out there. Um, the author of the study on the baited stretches, uh, was Hillary Clayton. Um, so if you wanted to look up more about them and, and how to apply them, you could read her papers and it's quite widely, I think she has, um, a couple of books to like activate your horse's core, um, is the name of one of them. Um, so those, type of things are widely available. And it, that is a great thing for like, I think every horse owner to have in their back pocket. I actually don't own that book. I keep meaning to order it and I haven't yet. Um, but, uh, but those type of things are, you know, like they're pretty much good for everybody. It's like us doing like our yoga and Pilates every day. Like it's increasing our motor control of our core, um, increasing our core strength and, uh, just improving the way that our bodies get around in, the, in this world. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're really helpful. And then to, um, you know, my clients, like I, I always take the time to show people how to do those type of exercises because I want people to see how to do them and make sure they're doing them properly, um, like the right amount of repetitions and, and that type of thing in order to get the best benefit out of them. Yeah. So I'll yeah. Hillary Clayton's name in the chat for everybody in case yeah. you look that up. And I think... The study you just posted, you said was sort of a follow-up, right? I think I think it was a follow-up, yeah. To, I was actually looking for the original study and I didn't come across. I thought I had it saved on my computer and then I couldn't find it when I was preparing for today. Yeah. Um, but I think this one was done later. Yeah, I know the one you and I have talked about, the previous one before, and I just wanted yeah. to mention it so that everybody else knows. Um, Dr. Clayton also studied those baited stretch exercises specifically in horses recovering from colic surgeries. Yeah, yeah. So I actually have that um, paper up there. That's the one I start accidentally. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, I'll mention that, um, I think, later on. Okay. Um, so yeah, if we're, we've 
talked about all of the in barn exercises and horses that are coming off of an injury. Um, what about horses with a known condition or that are waiting for a kissing spine surgery or chips fractures? Yeah. Um, so yeah, like those horses, um, they may be out of work or they may be on modified work and just awaiting some kind of procedure. Um, so they're laid up for their, from their regular job. Uh, but I think by now, like everyone is getting the idea that I really push for horses to exercise, um, as much as it's safe for them to do. Um, so for, first of all, um, just like to talk about kissing spine horses in particular for a minute, uh, we, uh, like all of the sort of protocols that are out there for kissing spine horses, like one of the most important aspects of it is improvement of posture and improvement of core strength and core control. Um, we know that when we can get that under control, those horses uh, have a better quality of life. They're able to support themselves better. Um, so no matter what we want to have that strength aspect, uh, as a part of their rehab as soon as possible. Um, and even in, in horses that maybe don't have a diagnosis, but have some back soreness, uh, again, we're going to be approaching them in a very similar manner. Um, so those horses, we may decide like perhaps they're too dangerous to ride, or we have a diagnosis. We know what's going on. We don't want to aggravate it by riding them, um, before they have a surgery, um, or other interventions, uh, we still want to be exercising those horses. So ideally we're not just going to turn that horse out in the paddock. We're going to be doing, um, those exercises. And at the very minimum, that's going to look like doing, um, baited stretches and some of those gymnastic exercises at least three days a week. Uh, so it's not a huge time commitment, but we know from those studies that that frequency and that type of exercise is enough to make a difference in the way the horse's spine moves and the way the muscles that support the spine can do so. So we definitely want to be doing those um, for sure. It may not feel like you're doing a lot, but uh, we have the research to show that it makes a difference to the horse. Um, so, and then, uh, you know, there may be other potential for doing some modified work with those horses. Again, it depends a little bit on what's going on. If you have a broken split bone or something, well, hopefully that'll get taken out really soon. Um, there are other, uh, you know, like maybe like OCD, um, where people are, uh, on the fence about whether to take chips out or leave them in those kind of things where you're maybe holding off working the horse, but you don't want to take them out of work completely, um, it, where you could do some modified work. So that would be, um, maybe doing some, uh, hacking if the horse can't be in regular full work, maybe they could still do some low impact work. Um, hacking out the horse is great because often they're working over varied terrain. And again, we really like that because it introduces challenges to the horse's proprioception um, and it builds up that like mind to body connection when they're moving over varied terrain not just in the arena um, again it depends on what's safe for you and your horse <laughs> not all horses are, are happy hackers but um, and that but anyway a varying terrain is, is one thing that you could do like very low impact work and just putting them on different surfaces um, you could also introduce poles uh, and walk poles actually have been shown to be really beneficial as well. It doesn't, they don't have to be trot poles. Walking over poles actually encourages um, uh, an increased stride length with the, the legs. They have to actively move the leg up and over the pole. So it can be very beneficial for their back and for their legs and for if they can actually improve their stride length as well. Um, and backing is another exercise that is a good core exercise. And it's really good for strengthening the quadriceps that surround the stifles. Um, we know stifles don't like to be out of work. They tend to get weak and loose. Uh, so anything that we can do to help um, stabilize those, those type of structures can be really useful. Um, so basically, uh, and then, you know, if your horse is capable of a little bit more, but they just can't be ridden due to say, um, like a waiting kissing spine surgery, you could always do some long lining with them. Um, if you don't know how to long line, but you're interested, I highly suggest, um, is sort of looking into it and finding someone that can help you teach your horse to do it safely, because it's actually 
if you can't ride your horse, it's a really amazing way to, uh, to exercise your horse because you have some contact with the bit or the cavison. You can do some bending work with them. They have the lines around their body that you can communicate with them through the lines. You can get them to engage their hind end, to go in a nice posture. Um, it can be a really valuable tool. Um, and aside from long lines, uh, there's also training aids that are really popular. Um, that's what I've started to pull up before. So I will pull it up now. Um, so these are just an example of some training aids that are out there. And if your horse is only walking, you can still work with them and walk. Um, you don't need a fancy training aid like these, but just to show you that they're, they're out there. The one on the left is, um, is that Linda Tellington Jones in the photo? I think I'm it not is. sure. It is. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Linda Tellington Jones, um, came what sort of popularized the idea of body wraps. Um, and you can see she's got some just cloth wraps on different parts of her horse. And she's basically just trying to stimulate, again, their proprioception um, to help them to feel where their core is, to help get some core engagement, to help get some hind end engagement, um, lift through the base of the neck, that type of thing. And uh, on the bottom is a Pessoa rig. And there's a lot of um, similar things uh, out there on the market as well um, in terms of lunging aids. And the idea being that Again, part of what the PSOA is meant to do, um, as well as the equiband system, which is above, is to improve thoracolumbar stabilization. So it's the same thing that we we're talking about with the belly lifts and the carrot stretches, getting those core muscles working to actually stabilize the spine better. Um, so a lot of people sort of look at that and they think it's just about creating a horse that knows how to go in an outline, but it actually does have the effect of um, improving the spinal stabilizers. Uh, and uh, the Equiband system um, did a research paper on this, uh, and there have been ones done on the Pessoa as well, as well as probably like other systems, but um, it was a, a four-week exercise program using the resistance bands of the Equiband system, um, and they, again, measured um, the dynamic stability, so the thoracic and lumbar um, rotation um, and they were able to improve that stability. Um, and I think they measured multifidus as well. And if you start to read the equine literature, you'll notice that like this is a very common theme of like outcome measures that we're looking for for horses is, um, yeah, so um, I actually can't remember if this particular study did. Um, it might have just measured movement, uh, but I would expect that the two go hand in hand because the muscles that are controlling that movement are the spinal stabilizers, like the multifidus muscle. So um, probably if you're getting one, you're getting the other. Yeah. And I also want to say, just so that people don't worry that they need to run out and buy like the most expensive thing. Now, the study I read was done before Equiband was on the market, but they looked at side reins versus a lot of the other gimmicky things, lunging aids and, and outline aids that we've seen in the last couple of years. And plain old side reins came out on top against every single one. The Pessoa rig was the only thing that was even remotely similar in terms of appropriate posture development. Everything else, like the bungees, um, German martingales, everything else that they looked at developed some sort of other weird, less appropriate posture, whether it was a little bit of bracing or unect. Like if all you've got is side reins, that is still pretty close to the best. Yeah, I haven't seen those studies, but that it's a really interesting point. And I would say um, there are a lot of training methods too that don't even use that. Um, they just use a lunge line and a cavison and um, transitions and bending exercises and those type of things and, and achieve really good results. So yeah, definitely don't think that you need to run out and buy a lunging system. Um, but just so that you guys know that there are training aids out there. Um, someone okay. asked, um, could you do these stretches and use the pads as a proactive therapy? Um, yes, I like the way you think. <laughs> um, 100%, like there's there's no reason why like doing this would ever 
really be harmful in a just like a regular fit working horse. If anything, it's going to benefit them. Um, and I think like challenging horses in different ways with groundwork and exercises like this um, can really help to like round them out because they're not necessarily going to be uh, trying out new movement patterns when they're just out in the paddock. Um, so we can introduce new movement patterns to them. And I think it is very beneficial for them. And, uh, and definitely in, um, you know, in the cases like this, where it, that this sort of brings up my next point uh, before we move on to the next topic, which is just um, about prehab itself. Um, if your horse is awaiting a surgery, you want to get them as strong as possible. Um, the research in the human world is un unequivocal about this. Um, prehab makes recovery from surgery faster and, and better and easier. So we do want to have the body um, as conditioned as possible um, to prevent injury, but also to, when you're going into, um, into surgery, we know that we don't want to um, have a sedentary animal for four weeks before surgery, we'd rather have them be um, as fit as possible. And before we move on, while we're still talking about known conditions, I also want to mention pregnancy, because I am a breeder, and I do a lot of um, foaling and things like that. So if that is something that anybody is ever thinking of, it really sort of needs to be treated along the same vein. It's a condition that's putting them out of work, that's changing the way that their body feels to them and moves. And, you know, like you and I talked about before, there's so much good research in humans on how much better we do recovering from, from delivery when we're fit, when the core is strong. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually had the opportunity to talk to Dr. Clayton on a webinar about using some of these exercises in pregnant mares when she was talking about recovering from major abdominal surgery. And she said, she, as far as she knows, nobody studied it specifically, but all of the same muscles are being affected. So there's no reason why that can't translate. And this is something that I've started doing with my pregnant horses to really keep the belly and the pelvis strong. Um, because something that can happen in older brood mares is the pelvis starts to tilt. And then when they pass manure, it actually slides down and contaminates everything else as it falls. And then we end up doing a procedure to stop that and we put them on different drugs. And if we can keep them fit and keep the pelvis stable during those pregnancies, when we're into a third, fourth, fifth pregnancy, it doesn't have to look like riding all of your brood mares every day. It can be that 20 minutes, three days a week to really help with that um, recovery after delivery. Yeah, that's a great point. I feel like our brood mares often um, kind of get the short end of the stick when it comes to um, like active care and exercise, uh, but it's definitely really important for them. And pregnancy as like, if there's any moms on the webinar tonight, like, you know, it takes a toll on the body and, um, you know, both from a hormonal sense and a biomechanical sense. So we definitely want to be caring for our brood mares. And uh, I you know, it would be interesting, Megan and I were talking about this a little bit before we started today, but it would be really interesting to see some research on, um, you know, sort of like a long-term pr perspective study on the length of a broodmare's career in broodmares who were um, fit and exercise versus uh, broodmares that aren't. And mm -hmm. I like, I don't see why there wouldn't be a difference both in the quality of life of the, the broodmare and their overall physique. And, and like you say, that ties right into the function of not only being able to comfortably carry a foal, but um, perhaps, you know, avoid some of the complications with infection and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I have to should. imagine that a change that drastic later in pregnancy also affects proprioception in some way. Like, I can't yes, do, yeah, know. and I think like as a chiropractor, um, you know, broodmares definitely have a lot of changes in their backs and pelvis, and they tend to lose a lot of top line, and like you say, um, have a bit of an inverted posture, partially just due to gravity, um, and we could definitely mitigate that with core muscles. Um, and we're we're bringing those uh, broodmares back into work. We need to make a consideration that they're coming back into work, um, you know, similar to a horse that, that's been uh, laid up for an injury and they've had a lot of changes to their body along the way. Um, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I'm gonna share my screen again and um, 
just pull up uh, the study that talks about that care program. Um, it wasn't actually for um, brood mares that they were studying. It was actually um, uh, colic surgery horses. But um, like Megan was saying, I think it's really applicable to uh, colic surgeries as well as um, horses like brood mares. So um, let me just see if I can share here again. I would also be really curious to know if horses are prone to the same sort of diastasis separation of the abdominal muscles that we talk about in humans. Um, I don't know if anybody's even looked at that. They, yeah, I, I'm not actually sure about cases of that, but um, when you see the, the type of muscle tissue that they have to cut through, you would have to think that it would be unavoidable. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, anyways, I pulled out, um, Megan actually put me onto this really cool paper. Um, it's a study that was done on um, return to training performance in horses that had colic surgery. And uh, what was really interesting to me is that, so basically the horses had colic surgery, they were put on stall rest for four weeks, and then they began this exercise program. Um, so the control group just did um, whatever normally happens. Um, so they were just um, put on stall rest for four weeks. The typical return to work after colic surgery is sort of six to eight weeks. So they basically just kind of waited and they started turning them out again. And then they sort of like waited for it to be time to start riding and then brought them back into ridden work. Um, and then the study group was given these core exercises um, starting at four weeks. And um, so the top left, is showing um, the control group on the left and the care group on the right. Um, care is an acronym for core, what is it? Core, core abdominal, abdominal rehab exercises. exercises yeah. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, it's a nice uh, acronym, but uh, the gray is showing horses that um, improved their performance. Um, and this is before and after colic surgery. So I thought this was really interesting. So this was, they like subjectively surveyed the owners of the horses. And so um, in the care group, um, most of the horses actually ended up coming back, performing better than they did before they went for colic surgery, um, just with these core exercises added into their regime uh, as they were brought back into work. So I thought it was super interesting. Um, and then on the bottom, it just shows the actual, how long it took the horses to return to work in each group. So the white bars in uh, are the control group and the gray bars, um, oh, sorry, the white bars are the care group and the gray bars on the control group. So the care group took less days to return to ridden work. Um, and then they took fewer days to return to like their regular training. And they also took fewer days to return to competition. Um, so this, uh, the addition of these exercises and it's the exercises we've already been talking about. Um, I'll show you just, this is from the study itself. And it, this is an example of week three. So each of the weeks looked similar. Um, uh, each week they added a couple exercises and then they added the number of repetitions that you're doing of the exercises. Um, but the first thing is like your typical belly lift and then um, doing uh, those pelvic tilts, um, doing baited stretches, chin to chest, chin between knees, chin between fetlocks, um, all very simple exercises that you could do with most horses right in the barn. Um, and uh, that was the only thing that they did differently between the care groups and the control groups. And they had those really great outcomes. So it just shows you, um, you know, these exercises. And I feel like saying this to my human patients all the time too, but like these exercises make a difference. There's a reason why we tell everyone to do them. And it's not just, you know, to give people something to do. Um, they actually do make a difference to um, our back health <laughs> and our horses back health. Uh, okay, so I'll get off my soapbox about that. And then <laughs> I mean, I, I can't even imagine how frustrating it must be <laughs> because I know that I'm going out and doing these stretches on my pregnant mares and I'm not doing what the physiotherapist wants for my knee. Like that is another webinar altogether. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think we kind of, um, 
I'm glad that we got to chat about um, the pregnant mares as well, because uh, I'm not sure if it's been studied. And sadly, it's kind of like um, human pregnant people. Um, sometimes we kind of get forgotten a little bit about and, uh, you know, a lot of women just end up leading a life with pelvic pain and incontinence and those type of things after giving birth because there there was no discussion with their doctor about doing um, postnatal rehab and that type of thing. So I think, you know, both in human and horse world, there's a, um, a need for a stronger advocacy for, for those groups. Yeah. I think just in general, people don't think of it as a condition. But, exactly. Yeah. You know, it it is a state that needs to be treated a little bit differently. For sure. Yeah. It's a major disruption to your normal bodily function. Yeah. Um, so I think we've covered everything we wanted to in terms of condi- known conditions. So what and we've started to talk about considerations for post-surgery. Um, I'm just gonna trying to go through our notes to make sure we haven't missed anything. Um, so let's talk about once the horse is cleared to return to ridden work. Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I won't spend too much time on this, but, um, just cause we're kind of at the end of our hour here. Um, but I think it's important to think about how we're going to bring horses back into work too, especially because we know that there's a certain percentage of horses that are going to become re-injured with the same injury when they return to work, um, So not only do we want to get them safely back into work and doing, you know, and recondition, but we want to think about doing it in a way that's going to give them the best long-term soundness as well. Um, So like you probably guessed already, I really advocate for an early return to activity. We want to get those horses moving um, early on in their rehab, but that doesn't mean that we're just going to throw them back into the regular training program. Um, We have to be smart about how we do it. Um, But I will mention, I think I have one more study to show you guys, and it's just about, um, this is a a topic that has been studied widely um, uh, on, uh, especially in humans, and just it's sort of the basic science going back into sort of like the um, mid-1900s, just on the effect of exercise on tendon and ligament strength. So funny, I had these lined up in what I thought was the right order, and I think we went through them completely backwards. Um, so this study was done in the um, late 1960s, I think, um, and it was just the influence of physical activity on ligaments and tendons. So it was a um, study that they did on rats, um, where they basically injured their ligaments and then um tested how they recovered uh, based on different groups. So like an exercise group and a non-exercise group. Um, And uh, so in the non-exercise group, they mobilized them. So they just kept them in really small cages. um, And then they had an exercise group where they returned to exercise. So in the chart on the left, you can see um, how they have it organized here is um, at three weeks, basically all the rats were immobilized. That was the amount of time they figured they would need to um, be immobilized so they didn't re-injure themselves um, and and give that ligament a chance to heal. Uh, And then at at six weeks, uh, the same thing. And then we start to get into the two different groups. So um, the third bar here is the six weeks of rest plus three weeks of... um, of cage. So the, this group stayed in the cage for a total of nine weeks. Um, and then the next bar is the exercise group. So they did the first six weeks of rest and then they did three weeks of um, exercise. Um, and you can see their, what they're measuring here is the strength of the ligament um, itself. And uh, so, and then we have, so at nine weeks, um, the immobilization group um, is this third bar here. And then at nine weeks, the exercise group has, the strength of the ligament has already increased dramatically um, to actually the point where it's almost as strong as the immobilized tendons were at 12 weeks post-recovery. So these guys have already gained like three weeks on the non-exercise group. Um, and then here at 12, re- 12 weeks post, um, the exercise group has the strongest ligaments of all. So you can see the difference that um, exercise has made on the strength of ligaments. And this has been studied to death. Um, we 
have um, millions of papers out there that um, show the same type of information um, for tendons, for muscles, for bone, um, pretty much every structure um, benefits in similar ways. Um, on the right, we're talking about um, the influence of a mobilization on surgically repaired ligaments um, of male dogs. Oh, that's weird. I thought this was a rat study. <laughs> um, anyways, all species basically operate the same. Um, so we, we can definitely take these species and look at them across. And like, obviously this basic science research was done to mostly support human um, rehab, but obviously we can take that again and uh, apply it into horse um, rehab as well. Um, so anyways, um, the legs that had repaired ligaments, um, but were not immobilized had significantly higher strength values than the repaired ligaments in immobilized legs. Um, so the, um, the, the control group here is the ones that were allowed to exercise. Um, and those are the vertical lines. And then the, the diagonal lines were the strength of the ligaments and the immobilized dogs. And you can see um, that they were, oh, sorry, this group, sorry, the group on the left is um, all of those dogs were immobilized. Um, one, and then uh, the group on the right were um, allowed to exercise, but you can see in both the control group and um, the repaired ligament group, um, the strength is higher. So, um, so that, sorry, these vertical lines are just the control group. So that's why it's the same um, in both, but the, the tendon repair group, so the, the one that they did that ligaments was damaged, you can see how much stronger the ligaments were in the group that exercised. So again, just sort of a lengthy description of um, what I've been saying all along, which is that we need that early return to movement in order to strengthen the tissue so that they heal as strong as possible. Um, my notes here again. So, and then the other things we wanna take into account is uh, like I said, the rate of reconditioning. So we're not just gonna throw them right back into their regular work program. Um, and these things you might think about are like the age of the horse. If your horse, horse is older, they might take a little bit more time to regain that strength. Um, if they have other comorbidities, um, like other old injuries, for example, um, we have to take that into account too when we're bringing them back into work. Um, other things to think about would be uh, taking care of their hooves. We want to make sure that we can optimize um, the hoof angles, especially when it comes to tendon injuries and those type of things, but really um, anything else that's going on in the body is going to be affected. So when you're bringing rehabbing a horse, you really want to make sure that they're on a short enough trim cycle or shoe cycle, um, and they are working with your farrier to optimize their posture um, uh, from the level of the hoof. Um, the other things you might take into account is level of training. And we talked about that earlier by saying, you know, you may introduce ridden work earlier in a horse that's better balanced, better trained, that you're going to be able to um, ride them in a, a more balanced way um, than maybe even if you were working them from the ground. Um, the other thing I just want to mention when you when it comes to returning to riding is saddle fit. Um, if your horse has been out of work for a while, you are not going to have the same fit of saddle that you did before that horse took the time off. So the first thing you want to do um, is make sure that you have a saddle fitter out um, and uh, do any adjustments to the saddle or, or changes to the pads or shims um, to manage the saddle fit while you're bringing your horse back into work. Uh, obviously, this is especially important when it comes to kissing spine horses, um, horses with back injuries, but really any horse, we want to make sure that we're not creating more problems, bringing them back into work. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that your horse is going to get fit faster than its tendons and ligaments are going to get conditioned. Um, muscles in the cardiovascular system, we know are uh, they have better... Uh, ability to come back quickly. So your horse is going to be feeling good. It's going to be getting strong. Um, and those tendons and ligaments are not going to be at their full capacity yet. Um, so you do want to make sure that um, despite the fact that your horse is feeling great, 
Um, that's, I think, where a lot of people start to ask a little bit too much too soon. And then we end up with a re-injury of a tendon or ligament. So we really do want to make sure we take our time in slowly reconditioning any tendon and ligament injuries. Um, and then we talked about pregnancy already adding complications because of the biomechanical changes and the hormonal changes in the body. Um, so getting your horse checked by a chiropractor before they get in, go back into work, whether it's a brood mare or um, uh, an injured horse is a really smart idea. Um, and then, uh, you know, when it comes to the type of work that's appropriate, we want to be thinking about the length of our sessions. We don't necessarily want to be working them for too long. Um, we want to make sure that we're working them on quality footing. Um, and, but we also want to make sure, like I talked about earlier, that we're varying the footing, um, but, but doing low impact work on new footing surfaces or, or challenging footing surfaces. Um, the frequency of sessions, uh, you want to make sure that it's not so infrequent that they're not going to become conditioned. If you're getting on a, a horse and you're bringing them back into work and you're riding them once every week or once every two weeks, um, you're not going to be getting to the level where those tissues are going to be responding, um, and, uh, and really conditioning and gaining strength. So you want to have at least three days a week of, of work to, in a specific way if you want to condition the body for that type of work. Um, that said, we don't want to be working the same muscles and ligaments five or six days a week. We want to, and by that I mean like doing the same repetitive motion. So training, you know, in canter on a 20 meter circle or training over fences, those type of things. We want to have a couple of work days that are sport specific. And then we also want to have some days that maybe focus on packing or groundwork, other things that are going to build up your horse's proprioception, um, build up your horse's balance and their suppleness um, that will help your overall end goal of having a functional horse, um, but aren't putting repetitive strain on the tendons necessarily. Um, and I uh, sorry, I think it's worth reminding people that all of this is true if they're just coming into work the first time. This doesn't have to be a rehab from an injury. Like this yeah. is the way we should be conditioning them all the time. And it's interesting that you, you talk about training level, because one of the things I see when I'm coaching is that the horses that were working at a higher level before the injury, I feel like there's more temptation to push them harder. I think when we're starting with a horse that didn't have maybe a great level of education to begin with, people are a little bit more considerate of where they're at physically. Whereas when we get to that state where the muscles and the cardiovascular system are conditioned, we get it in our head that they used to be able to do this. And that's when we go too long with a single session or too many sessions in a week. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that. And it just goes back to my point because your horse starts feeling like the most, their old self, right? And so you think, okay, we, we're here, we've made it. Um, but underlying that, we don't have the exact same musculoskeletal system that we did prior. And, and if they're fatigued, they're going to compensate in other ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that's a really good point. And I think a lot of us, um, you know, people that have done a lot of like weight training or other types of like fitness work themselves are very familiar with how it feels when you're um, really pushing yourself to the max to, be, to gain strength and it doesn't feel good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when we do too many repetitions of high load activities, we end up um, getting fatigued and that's when we're more likely to um, lose our form and create uh, more problems, uh, like more injuries. So yeah, that's a really good point. Where I find that I see it the most is this horse knows how to work in an outline. I don't think people give enough credit to how much physical work it is to hold that posture over a long yeah. period. And I tend to see people right from day one back to tack walking, wanting them to work in an outline for 20 minutes. And I can't do a hundred crunches. Like, that's, that's what that is. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's knowing how to do something. And if anyone's ever taken a break from riding and gone back to it, you probably experience this yourself. You're like, I know what I want my body to do, but like, it just can't quite do it. Or you can do it for five minutes and then you're pooped. Right. So the same applies to your horses for sure. And like you were mentioning, it's not just horses returning from injury. Like this is a good thing to keep in mind. Just you know, like anything else, like rehab is prehab is prevention. Um, you know, the body works in the same way in all three situations. And uh, yeah, we do have to be careful um, 
to condition our horses in a thoughtful manner, um, both for their bodies and, you know, for their minds. We want them to be happy and not resentful of the work that we ask them to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that wraps things up. And I think we um, uh, dealt with most of the questions as we went through, but if anyone has any questions now would be a great time to either pop on the mic or just type it into the chat and we can address things. Um, it's probably getting towards everyone's bedtime while well, some people might be night hawks. I don't know. <laughs> some people are going to get in their car and go night check their horses. Uh, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, if nobody's got any questions, thank you, ladies, for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. I was really excited to talk about this. Um, and I am going to post the replay on my YouTube channel, at least in the short term. Um, so if you know anybody who wanted to come tonight and couldn't make it, um, I will make it available and I will pop the link into the event page um, once that is up, because that will take a little bit of time in the processing. <laughs> My computer is a little bit elderly. Um, well, thanks for inviting me, Megan. I hope that everyone um, got some good info out of this session. I enjoyed chatting with you about it. And uh, yeah, I think it's a great, um, important topic to chat about. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I think that we're hitting a point in our industry where we're starting to do better. And I really just want to help people further that Exactly, exactly. Um, if anyone, yeah, I was just gonna say if anyone wants to um, uh, get in touch afterwards and, and follow up with any questions or anything, I know uh, for myself and I'm sure Megan too, be happy to um, to touch base with you one-on-one -on -one, either through um, like social media messaging or, or email. We're both pretty accessible online. So uh, we'd be happy to chat with you more. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, thank you everybody. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I got a lot out of tonight. So thank you, Steph, for putting that all together for us. Um, I really love, especially seeing the research like that is, um, it's really exciting to see that people are looking at this and that we yeah, are. Yeah. Some really nerdy people have actually measured these things and <laughs> yeah. science is real. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Take care, everyone. Thank you guys.